Good morning, everybody. (laughs) Welcome to church this Sunday. Uh, We're going to prepare first by talking about our upcoming opportunities and announcements. Upcoming opportunities. Today, the Board of Christian Education meets after worship. Tuesday, if you have any items for the May-June newsletter, please get them to Debbie. Next Sunday, the Rivers of Life Clergy Band will be in concert at Verdon UMC at 6.30. Sunday, May 5th, will be Graduate Sunday during worship. That evening at 5 p.m., our church will host the North Mac Baccalaureate Service for the North Mac Ministerial Alliance. See the bulletin board in Pittman Hall for flyers regarding other local events. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Wow, that's awesome. Um, For our weekly opportunities for worship and service, Sunday we'll have SWAT classes at 6 p.m. tonight. Uh, Monday, 6.30 p.m. will be Zoom Bible study. And Wednesday, we'll have 6 p.m. supper and kids club until 7.30 p.m. Now, birthdays and anniversaries today. Happy birthday on Tuesday to River Hawkins. (laughs) Are there any other birthdays or anniversaries that need to be said? Nope. Okay. Now we're going to begin with our opening chorus, Psalm 27. This is just the first verse of uh, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If you, I mean, some of you know this song. I've heard it before. It's kind of an older chorus, I guess. Uh, one of the early songs I learned as a, as a young Christian. But uh, let's stand together and sing it this morning. Our call to worship, none can believe how powerful prayer is, and what is it able to affect but those who have learned it by experience, Martin Luther. Now if you'll stand and sing number 385, Holy God, we praise thy name.
now is children's time for pa with Pastor Marty if the kids want to come up. It looks like a cousin's convention this morning. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good, that's good. I was going to read a little story to you from the Bible today. This is uh, uh, the reading for today from John's Gospel, and it's Jesus talking about being the good shepherd. We've talked a little bit, I think, about Jesus as the good shepherd, haven't we? Remember talking about Jesus being like the shepherd and we're like his sheep, but the sheep of his pasture. Well, this is what Jesus says about, about him as the good shepherd and us as his sheep. He says, let me find the right, the right verses here. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That means he'll use, he'll protect the sheep with his life, Okay. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Um, then he says, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Now, he's talking about, when he's talking about laying down his life for his, us, he's talking about when he was going to die on the cross for us, he laid down his life for us so that we could have forgiveness of sins and eternal life, right? But uh, the good shepherd, I just want you guys to always know that Jesus is our good shepherd, that he gives himself for us, and also that the shepherd... In watching over the sheep, one of the shepherd's jobs, now this goes back, you know, back to a long time ago when a shepherd would be out in the field with the sheep. Now if you see sheep in a, in a pen, they're usually just in a pen with a fence around it, and the farmer just kind of keeps an eye on them as he has it. You know, every once in a while he might check on them, but he's not going to be out there with them all the time. But back in those days when Jesus was on the earth, the shepherd would stay with the sheep out in the pasture, why do you think he would need to stay out there with them? That's right. You know, and still in, out in the country, even around here, we don't have wolves, but we, we have a, something that kind of looks like a wolf. You know what that animal is called? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And will they kill sheep? If they have a chance to, they will, won't they? And so that's, that's maybe more easy for us to understand about coyotes than about wolves. But this, it's the same thing that we uh, need to protect the sheep from, from predators, like you said, Allie. And uh, for who, when Jesus is talking about being the shepherd and we're like the sheep, what, would, what, what kind of predators do you think we have to be concerned about? Michael? Like the bad guys. The bad guys, that's right. Yes. And like Michael's saying, there are people that, that do want to harm other people. And so that's why we want to be sure that we pray that the Lord will protect us from, from those kind of things, from bad people, from bad things in the world that, uh, that w will do us harm. And that's why Jesus says that I am the good shepherd. I will lay down my life for you. I will watch over you and protect you. Okay. I think we need to sing happy birthday to... Uh, river this morning but you, now you said you already had the party is that right on saturday but your birthday's not till tuesday is that right okay well you're getting you're getting a double dose then aren't you well let's let's sing happy birthday to river this morning and then i might sing one other song that i was thinking about but let's let's sing happy birthday first okay let's see if i can get this and you did i hear you say you're going to be seven years old I think that's good enough, Keith. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear River. Happy birthday to you. 
The song I, uh, I was thinking about this morning to go along with that scripture was one that says, it is all right. I think I sang it maybe several months ago we sang this song. It is all right as long as I've got my Lord beside me, it is all right. As long as I know he's in control, as long as he's watching over my soul, as long as he's with me wherever I go, it is all right. Let's see if we can sing that together. It is all right, all right. It is all right, all right. As long as I've got my Lord beside me, it is all right. As long as I know he's in control, as long as he's watching over my soul, as long as he's with me wherever I go, it is all right. Let's sing it one more time. It is all right, all right. It is all right, all right. As long as I've got my Lord beside me, it is all right. As long as I know he's in control, as long as he's watching over my soul, as long as he's with me wherever I go, it is all right. So the Lord doesn't want us to live in fear, even though we live in a world as you guys are already knowing, even at your young age, that bad things can happen to people, right? But, but God doesn't want us to live always, every day, waking up worried about what bad thing might happen today or tomorrow. But he wants us to trust him to watch over us and to keep us in his care. Lord, I pray with the children this morning, just fill them, Lord, not with fear or concern or worry, but Lord, fill them with peace in knowing that you are our good shepherd and that you watch over us each day of our lives. We pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Now it's time for Children's Church if the kids want to go downstairs. Now, if the ushers would like to get prepared, this is the time for the giving of our tithes and offerings. Everyone, please stand. with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for everything you've given us, and I pray that we can use all these proceeds to do your will, and pray that these will be blessed to help us um, carry out whatever it is that you want us to do. And in your holy name, amen. Now, if you'll continue standing and sing hymn number 456, My Jesus, I Love Thee.
now is our time for prayer concerns and praises. Will you all bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now with um, lots of medical problems, lots of prayers, and I pray that uh, you can answer those, but you can also give peace and patience and comforts to those who are in those problems right now, and I pray that they'll look to you and they'll look for your will even in these dark times, and I pray that you will show yourself to them and you will just give them whatever they need, whether it be healing or peace or comfort, and I thank you for all the praises as well that we have. I know those tend to get overlooked, but pray that uh, we can lift up our praises and continue to find praises in our um, daily lives, and I ask that all this just go to you and that you can bless it and you can find answers for those who need them. And in your holy name, amen. amen. Now bring up Pastor Mark. Thank you, Sophie. Thanks for uh, leading us in worship today. I really appreciate you. You're doing a great job, and uh, it means a lot when... Uh, especially when young people are involved in, in worship because sometimes it seems like the, the church is just getting older and older. It's just so great to see young people involved and in, in, uh, bringing up the next generation of uh, church leaders and people that are going to keep, keep church doors open because we really need to pray for uh, the church around the world, but here in our own country and in, in our little towns like Verdon where, where so many churches are struggling just to keep the doors open. We can thank God, even though we're a small congregation, I think we are a, uh, a healthy congregation. And uh, one of the best things we can do as a small congregation is to pray as, as uh, Sophie led us in prayer this morning and to continue to lift up those people in our lives around us in the communities and people that we're aware of that, that need our prayers. And I think we, we underestimate, and I think that quote from Martin Luther uh, said as much, that we, we really don't know how much our prayers can do. And so sometimes I think we pray almost just out of habit. I guess we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to sing some hymns. We're supposed to preach a sermon. But just to realize how important it is that uh, God invites us, encourages us, Jesus even commands us to pray, to ask for those things that we know people have need of, not just in our own lives, but the lives of those people that, that he calls us to love and care for. So uh, we never want to take for granted the power of prayer. Uh, I was looking at the different uh, passages this morning, uh, or this during this past week, thinking about which, which uh, passage I, I would... Uh, Try to prepare a message based on, and I and I chose the the passage in First John chapter three. This is going to be my text this morning. Um, I want to talk about things worth knowing this morning. Three things, and specifically that John mentions in in the text. But I thought about how much people like to be. We use that expression in the know. You know, I want to be in the know. I don't. People feel left out if they don't know everything. And so you got people that just kind of live with a a 24-hour news cycle going on in their house, or they've got the radio on all the time, television on all the time. And the way things are, the way knowledge is increasing and, and the, how quickly it's, it's um, almost doubling every so many years, the amount of knowledge that we have, I think it's really harder and harder to be fully informed these days. And it's, we sort of all suffer, I think, from, from TMI, just from having just too much overload of information coming in. So we still believe there's a saying that knowledge is power, but I think the question that we really need to ask ourselves is what is it that's really worth knowing? What do we really know that's worth knowing? Uh, there's this, a quote I saw that says, we're drowning in information and starving for knowledge. Now that quote came out in 1985, almost 40 years ago. I would change that to say we're drowning in knowledge, but we're starving for wisdom. We're starving for what to do with the knowledge that we have. And as things like AI and different things come on the scene, just because we have the ability to do something, I think the old movie, Kyle, the big movie buff, Jurassic Park, the famous line of Jeff Goldblum, I think he says, uh, because we could do it, we never stop to ask ourselves if we should do it. When we're talking about you know, uh, bringing the dinosaurs back to life. And uh, scientists are trying to create all kinds of life forms in, in the laboratories now 
Just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it. Because we have the knowledge doesn't mean we should use that knowledge. There are many things that we do need to know, obviously. There are many things that are worth knowing, and then there are some things not worth knowing. I don't really, I shouldn't know how to make my next online purchase using your credit card, for example, right? <laughs> that's knowledge I don't need to know. That's not knowledge that's good for me to know. But the Bible still is our best source of knowledge that's worth knowing, things worth knowing, the Word of God. It's, it's such a wellspring of wisdom and knowledge for us. And this passage in 1 John 3, as I read it, I noticed that John mentions uh, three times in here things that we can know, things that are very much worth knowing, and how we can know with certainty things about God can only be found in the Word of God. So let me just uh, briefly this morning share with you three things worth knowing. First, John's Gospel, chapter 3, and I'm going to read, first of all, verse 16 through 18. Here's what John writes. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So the first thing John mentions that we can know and that's worth knowing is He says, by this we know love. By this we know love. John says that we can know love by the fact that God, who is love, laid down his life for us. I was explaining that to to the kids this morning, that the good shepherd, he says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And now John, really along the same line, is saying in his epistle this morning that it's by this that we know God loves us because in the person of Jesus, his beloved son, he came to earth and laid down his life. And, and if that doesn't demonstrate love, I don't know what does. In fact, Jesus said on another occasion, greater love has no one than this, than that a man or a woman should lay down their life for another. That's the ultimate expression of love is the laying down of life. And he says then, uh, by, the time wrote, by the time that John <clears throat> excuse me, wrote this first epistle, he had come to know a lot about the love he speaks about, and he shares the secret of knowing whether our love is genuine or not when he says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers, that is, for fellow believers, fellow Christians. Of course, others as well, but he speaks uh, specifically to the church. He says, if anyone, though, has the world's goods, and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, he says, let us love not just in word, not just in the way we talk, but let's love in deed and in truth. So this is John's litmus test for love, not what it makes us say. We can say, I love you. We can say we love each other and say all the right words, but John says what really matters, the litmus test of love is what it inspires us to do for each other, not just to say love, to speak words of love, but to do acts of love and kindness. If we say we love God but do not demonstrate that love by how we care for others, then our profession of faith is basically not true. The only love that really matters, the love that is worth knowing, is the love that's manifested in our actions, not merely in our words. And that's God's love. That's what John is saying. God demonstrated his love for us through actions, not just through words, by sending his son to die for us on the cross and that great act of love and compassion for us. Okay, now the second passage, I want to read verses 19 to 23. Next, John says, By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. John says, by this 
we know that we are of the truth. This morning in Sunday school class, we were reading in John's Gospel, chapter 18, where Jesus is arrested, and he stands before Pilate, who begins to interrogate him about his claim to be a king, and Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this earth. He says, those who are of the truth follow me, and Pilate says to Jesus, what is truth? We're living at another moment in history where the question is being asked, what is truth? What is the truth in our world today? What can we know about what is true? There's so much false narrative, there's so much disinformation, misinformation, half-truths floating around the world. How can we know what to believe about the truth. Well, it's interesting, when, Je- when Pilate asks Jesus, what is truth, Jesus is silent. Jesus does not answer him because Jesus is the truth standing right in front of Pilate. He doesn't say a word about what is truth in answer to Pilate's question. But Jesus does give us, as believers, an answer to the question, what is truth, when he says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. When we come to believe in Jesus as Lord, when we trust him as our Savior, when we welcome him into our hearts and lives, our hearts find reassurance in his presence. This is what John is saying in this passage, and he adds that whatever, whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. You know, there's an old saying about let your conscience be your guide. Everybody, I suppose, has heard that expression at one time or another. Well, that's only true to a certain point, I think, for us as believers in Jesus Christ. Our conscience is usually reliable, and even as a, as a small child, our conscience is already pretty active. We know usually when we've done something wrong, don't we? In fact, my, my dad once said, I didn't believe in original sin till I had children. <laughs> I think I probably should take that personally. I probably was, was exhibit A of that. Our conscience is usually reliable, but our conscience is not infallible. And I want to make that point this morning. Sometimes we may feel guilty about something when we really shouldn't. Maybe somebody has laid a guilt trip on you, made you feel guilty about something when, in fact, you, you really have nothing that you should feel guilty about, but somebody has... has uh, convinced you that you should feel guilty, and therefore, when you've, somebody tells you that, you feel like, I, yeah, I guess I should feel guilty. And then, of course, there are other times when we don't feel guilty, but we should, because we know we have done something wrong, but we're, we're trying to bury it or deny it ever happened, but in fact, we did something wrong, and we should feel that kind of guilt. But John says something really interesting in this gospel, or in this epistle, he says, Whenever our hearts condemn us, when we feel guilty, he said, our God is greater than that guilt. Our God is more knowledgeable, and he's more reliable. God, John says, knows all things. God knows our motives. He knows our desires. He knows our aspirations, the things we hope for. God knows the things we're afraid of. And he is more merciful with us than we often are with ourselves, and certainly more merciful with us than we are with other people in our lives much of the time. So it's important that we trust God and his word and not our own feelings, especially when it comes to the truth about God, because we can convince ourselves of all sorts of things about God. Well, if God really loved me, fill in the blank, or if God were really all-powerful, fill in the blank. What can we really know about God? Only what God reveals about himself in his word. And it's how we can know about how we stand with God by what God tells us in his word. So sometimes, you know, I know people sometimes struggle with feeling, I don't feel, I don't feel saved. I accepted Jesus into my heart. I went forward at the church. I was baptized. And sometimes I just feel like God doesn't love me. I don't feel like I I, I have the assurance that I'm going to go to heaven. That assurance comes through the word of God, not through us convincing ourselves or trying to talk ourselves into it. It's trusting in the word of God. His word is trustworthy and true. I want to just emphasize that uh, this morning with you, that you have no doubt about the truth of God's word. 
And now finally, verse 24. John writes, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. The third thing we find here that's worth knowing is that God abides in us. One of our Lord's most blessed commandments, John 15, 4, abide in me. And a few verses later, he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And that's what John is saying here. Whoever keeps God's commandments abides in God and God abides in him. Now, John knew this in theory, but John also knew it in practice. And that is what he's saying in this verse. All believers in Jesus Christ, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, then you are in him. You are in him. You are your life is hidden with Christ. You're hidden with God in Christ. And it's by the presence and the ministry of the Holy Spirit who indwells us that we have that assurance. It's the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. That's why John says, and by this we know that he abides in us. How do we know? Because he has sent his own Son, Spirit, into our hearts, and into our lives. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. It's by the presence and ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we are enabled to know the love of God, the saving grace of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of our sins. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And so we need to be still before God because sometimes we think, well, I can't hear God speaking to me. Sometimes it's because we don't take the time to be quiet with God and allow the Holy Spirit to minister in our lives. We, we live such rushed lives these days uh, I remember at, a, at an altar, a woman, a friend of mine was praying at the altar. This was many years ago. And this was back when the olden days when people used to come to the altar and kneel at a, at a, at a kneeler and pray. And an older woman in the, in the church turned to, to my friend and said, we just don't tarry anymore. And this was many years ago. And I'm thinking, Terry, <laughs> that word might as well be stricken from our, our dictionaries. No one tarries anymore. In other words, just taking time to wait, to wait upon God, to wait in quiet. We, we can't stand it when the light turns green and the car in front has not already hit the gas pedal. We're, we're just like, I got to get there. You know, and that's just, we, we have become victimized by our culture. And we need to be careful as Christians that we don't just become Everything that the world is, Jesus says, I, I want you to stay in the world, but I don't want you to be of the world. We shouldn't be the one honking when the light turns green. We should be present. Now, I'll admit, I don't like somebody tarrying in front of me when, right, <laughs> when the light turns green either. <laughs> but <laughs> that said, when I'm not behind the wheel, what is it about being behind the wheel that just brings out the worst in people's personalities? Is it just having like two tons of metal around you and a motor just makes us like all of, you know, uh, in, more where Barbara's from, Minnesota, that there's this, there's this saying about being Minnesota nice. Have you ever heard that? Well, it ain't happened on the freeways, I'll tell you that, because the last few years as the Twin Cities has become more congested, oh, the, 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 the the attitudes on, on, on the freeways are, are, are not, they're not Christian, let's just put it that way. God does not want us to live in constant doubt or insecurity about where we stand with him. We may be insecure about where we stand with some people in our lives. We don't have to wonder where we stand with God. And I really want to emphasize that this morning. God is greater than our heart. Greater than our doubts, he's greater than our fears. And it is into each one of our hearts. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, trust me. No, don't trust me. Trust the word of God. Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, that into each believing heart, God has poured his love in the person of his own 
Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells within us. That's why and how we have eternal life is because we have the eternal life of God in us because we have the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. If the same Spirit, Paul says in Romans 8, who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, and it's a rhetorical question because that is in fact the case, if the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit who dwells in you. And he's talking about the resurrection of the dead, but we don't have to wait until the resurrection to experience the life of God in us. We have the life of God in us from the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. To those who believe, he gives eternal life. God gives to each one of us who believes in Jesus. This is kind of just a recap here of what John is saying in this passage. He gives us to know love by his laying down his life for us. He gives us to know that we are of the truth as he reassures our hearts through the scriptures, through the word of God. And he reassures us and gives us to know that he abides in us by the person of of the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. And by the power of that Holy Spirit and his help, I pray that we may abide in God's love and truth, that we may abide in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and that we may become those fruitful branches. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will bear much fruit. Let's stand this morning and sing a closing hymn, Send the Light. This is kind of a missionary song. Um, I think it's in the mission portion of the hymnal, but we are all missionaries. <laughs> Sometimes, whether we want to be or not, we're, we're, we're preaching a gospel of some sort or another every day of our lives by the way we live and love others or fail to. But I just uh, pray that this, this song may it inspire us to uh, go out with the good news of, of life in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for your grace in our lives. Thank you for the light that you have given to us, Lord Jesus, that you are the light of the world, but you also call us to be 
your reflections to be the light of the world around us that others may see your grace in our lives and give glory to the Father in heaven and also come to that light themselves, Lord. So we, we just take a few moments now to tarry in your presence. Father, we ask you to fill us with the truths of your word. We thank you for the infilling of your Holy Spirit that the Son you sent into this world, his Spirit dwells in us by your gift to us. Lord, thank you for pouring your love to us in the person of your spirit. And I pray that you would just grant us the grace to have an ever greater sensitivity to your guidance, your presence in our lives by your spirit. And as he guides us into all truth, Lord, may we not have to doubt what the truth is as we continue to turn to your word, to continue in your word, to be true disciples of your beloved son, Jesus. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you his peace. Go with God's peace and grace. I believe there's a uh, Christian Ed meeting right after service. Is that right? Okay. God bless you. You're dismissed.